Welcome to all viewers of Prudent on this event, Ghazali. Today we are engaging in conversation with Ambassador Rajendra Abhyankar. He is a former Indian diplomat with close to four, year, four decades of experience, having served as India's ambassador in various capitals, including in the critical West Asian states of Turkey and Syria. So today we'll be engaging in conversation with him on various aspects of the Middle East and how it impacts India's foreign policy. So welcome, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, let's begin with the most recent of developments, which is the nuclear agreement which has been concluded between Iran and the six major powers in the world. Yeah. How do you read and assess this nuclear agreement in the context of non-proliferation and in the context of normalizing Iran's relations with major powers? Well, firstly, I think uh, let's uh, start by saying that the agreement itself is uh, still, I mean, they have agreed on it, but it's going to require 90 days before it is implemented. And during that 90 days, uh, we don't know how the US Congress is going to deal with it. Uh, of course, President Obama has said that he is going to veto any negative action they take. So that is, uh, let us assume that it will uh, go ahead. In terms of the non-proliferation uh, agreement, I should say that I, I'm sure the readers are aware that we have never signed a non-proliferation agreement, we meaning India. Now, uh, Iran had signed a non-proliferation agreement. They were required to observe its discipline. So we had in the statement that we made in Riyadh, uh, when former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had gone there, had said that Iran must clarify its intention in terms of the NPT. Uh, but uh, we have always maintained that the non-proliferation framework as it exists, which is embodied in the non-proliferation treaty and its review conferences that have taken place every year, is an unequal treaty. Because just to quickly give you an idea of the history, India was one of the first countries to sponsor a resolution on non-proliferation in 1968. When the negotiations actually started in 1970, we realized that this was going to be an unequal treaty because those who had nuclear weapons would be allowed to keep it and those who didn't have it would never be able to have it. So we had said that we are never going to sign this agreement. And it has been our contention right from then that the non-proliferation framework has to be different. We are as much committed, India, to disarmament as any other country would like to, but uh, not on these terms. So what it means, and you have seen now, apart from Iran, North Korea was also the, a signatory to the NPT. And they still went ahead and had the nuclear bomb. So in fact, that framework is, needs to be changed. Our position is, that the parameters of the non-proliferation framework needs to be different. Because we would definitely like to be in the tent rather than outside the tent. And I am sure Iran would like to. And now that Iran may end up having a nuclear bomb, I mean this is supposed to only delay it by 10 years. But we can be sure that there are other countries who are waiting for uh, doing something of the same kind. Um, I don't have to name them, I think they are pretty much well known. But uh, so we need to actually work on a different non-proliferation. So that is my view on the Iran thing, that I think the non-proliferation framework has failed. And uh, it, if you really need to uh, reduce the number of nuclear weapon powers, you need to find a different framework. And it has to start from the basis that using a nuclear bomb is not about victory in a war. Using, using a nuclear bomb is about annihilation. That is where it has to start from. But I won't go more into the detail. And you said how... Uh, about the major powers, the, the relations Iran would have. I think them. the major powers have been quite happy because it's 20 months of tortuous negotiation that they've been able to get Iran at least cornered into a certain framework for the next 10 years, which will require Iran to reduce its uh, uh, low enriched uranium and 
reduce the number of centrifuges from almost 20,000 to 6,000. So everything is going to get delayed. I think uh, uh, they also realize that Iran has importance for them, particularly today, in many different ways. First is that Iran is a big country. It's a resilient country. It has a population of 77 million. It's a huge market which has been denied to them thanks to the sanctions. I am told that already Western uh, traders are camping in Tehran looking for deals. I hope some Indians have gone there also. But uh, that's one. The second thing is Iran has, is virtually America's neighbor in a, in a uh, relative sense because America was occupying Iraq and America was occupying Afghanistan and Iran sits right in the heart of that. So, and in fact, now the enemies that Iran has and America has are the same. These are Sunni extremists. So, if they need Iran on their side, if you want to bring in any kind of stability in that region. Third is of course, that Iran is still a, an access not just for India, but for many countries to Central Asia. And fourth is oil. Now, oil, Iran's oil will be extremely important for us. Maybe not as important for the Western powers. Certainly, probably in the next few years, America is supposed to become self-sufficient. May not be dependent so much. But uh, I think uh, some Western countries would be dependent indirectly on Iranian oil and gas because what would happen now is that there has been a great difficulty in exploiting the undersea resources, oil and gas resources, which Iran has in the Caspian Sea. And I am sure that will get a boost, in which case the oil will go up to Europe. So since you, since you referred to India, let's, let's look directly at what this uh, nuclear deal could mean in terms of implications for India. Yeah. Because India has been trying to navigate through a very complicated relationship with yeah. Tehran, yeah. which came under strain as Western sanctions were imposed on, on yeah. Tehran. Yeah. Now, of course, Prime Minister Modi has met uh, President Rouhani on the sidelines of the, of the meeting in Ufa. Yeah. So how do you see India being able to develop its relationship now with Iran uh, at a comprehensive level? I think uh, it's a big opportunity for us. But much depends, like in most things Indian, how quickly we can decide, how quickly we can implement. I would put that as the first point. But what we have been able to do so far is very, uh, I think very cleverly, with great finesse as much as we could, been able to manage three triangles which intersect at India simultaneously. So the first, tri because the, while India is one, uh, one point, one of the angles in the tri each of the triangle, the other two angles are by countries which are opposed to each other. So you have, we have this triangle of Riyadh, that is Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran and India. Then you have the triangle of Israel, Tehran and India. And then you have the triangle of US, India and Iran. So we, we are there with three triangles and we are trying to manage all these things. And jostling around. And yeah. it's not been easy, but we have done it quite well. But at some cost. First thing is in terms of oil and I think that will be the impact. I mean, there will be two impacts. First is with Iranian crude coming onto the market, the crude oil prices will not rise. Certainly people are looking at prices which are around $50 a barrel. So long as oil prices remain low, it's good for our economy and I hope it stays. Second is that we should now be able to increase our offtake of Iranian crude. Because a good thing about Iranian crude is if it comes down from, bus, uh, from uh, uh, the southern part of Iran, uh, it comes directly to India, it doesn't have to go through the Hormuz Straits, which is a big advantage because Hormuz Strait carries 60% of the world's oil, you don't know what will happen. So oil supply, we should be able to increase and we should for two reasons. One is that Iran and Iraq have been our traditional suppliers and majority of our refineries in India process the crude that comes from these countries which is called high sulphur crude and not the lighter crude. So it's better for us and we actually used to get 18% of our requirements from Iran. 
then we reduced it to 12 percent and then to 8. We reduced it to 12 under UN sanctions which we had to observe, but from 12 to 8 was US pressure. But at some point it reached a, it's reached a level where we could not possibly have done more. So I think we should build it back. Second is uh, the export of petroleum products to Iran. We have been big suppliers of, I mean Reliance, I think the Reliance uh, Jamnagar refinery was a big supplier of petroleum products to Iran which they are critically short of, which were shut down because of the US uh, pressure and also because Reliance has some interest in the United States. But also Hinduja used to, the Gulf oil used to do it. So I think our petroleum product exports should increase. Although on the other hand, since there will be other suppliers on the market, there will be competition, but at least it will increase. The third is uh, still in the oil and gas sector. The third is uh, we have two areas. One is what is called the Farzad B gas field. Now this field was discovered by ONGC in 2008, but you know for obvious reasons even though Iranians wanted us to put in a lot of money there, yeah. we could not or did not whichever is applicable. Now there is a little bit of a problem because the Iranians are considering that maybe they will not give it to us but give it an auction it. Now whether now here is the test of our diplomacy whether we can actually get that done. At the same time, we also have an interest in a port called the Shabahar port, yes. which is on the same coast as the Gwadar port, which the Chinese are developing in Pakistan, so down from Karachi. Now, Shabahar, we have had a number of discussions with Iran for the last 10, 15 years. Um, but we have again held back in terms of how much money to put in there, because it is a big, huge project. One is to develop the port. Second is to connect, um, develop a ro road link from that port to the Iran border which then hooks on to a place called Milak which is on the Iran 